This book is called A Medieval Feast, written and illustrated by Aliki. Aliki is the single name used by a much loved um, writer and illustrator of books for young learners. Her real full name is Aliki L. Brandenburg. That is her picture right there taken from the HarperCollins site, the publishers for whom she worked. A Medieval Feast takes place in about 1400. It's a made-up um, story, but it's based on historical fact. The Middle Ages lasted from 500, roughly, to about 1500, and Aliki, by using her imagination, takes us back to those times. On this left page, Aliki pays tribute to the medieval artists, whose names we don't know, who left many gorgeous tapestries, paintings, uh, statues behind. And on the right, she dedicates her book to Mother, Helen, Vilma, and Peter, um, and remembering the annual feasts that their family had. It was announced from the palace that the king would soon make a long journey. On the way to his destination, the king and his party would spend a few nights at Camdenton Manor. The lord of the manor knew what this meant. The king traveled with his queen, his knights, squires, and other members of his court. There could be a hundred mouths to feed. Preparations for the visit began at once. The Lord and Lady of the Manor had their serfs to help them. The serfs lived in huts provided for them on the Lord's estate, each with its own plot of land. In return, they were bound to serve the Lord. They farmed the land, managed the manor house, and if there was a war, they had to go to battle with the Lord and the King. But now they prepared. The manor had its own church, which was attended by everyone on the estate. The manor house had to be cleaned, the rooms readied, tents set up for the horsemen, fields fenced for the horses. And above all, provisions had to be gathered for the great feast. The royal suite was redecorated. Silk was spun. New fabric was woven. The royal crest was embroidered on linen and painted on the king's chair. The Lord and his party went hunting and hawking for fresh meat. Hunting was a sport for the rich only. The wild animals that lived on the Lord's estate belonged to him. Anyone caught poaching, hunting illegally, was severely punished. They would hunt for boar, a stag, a hare, a quail, a crane, a pheasant, a partridge, or a heron, sometimes. Falcons and hawks were prized as pets. They were trained to attack birds for their masters to capture. They trapped rabbits and birds of all kinds and fished for salmon and eels and trout. There were fruits and vegetables growing in the garden, herbs and flowers for sauces and salads, and bees made honey for sweetening. Serfs hid in bushes and caught birds in traps. They set ferrets into barrows to chase out rabbits. Grains were ground into flour at Lord's Mill and baked into trenchers and other breads. 
butter was churned, cheese was made, and ale and wines were ready in the brew house. The king was almost there. Trenchers were flat, coarse bread used in place of plates. Peasants ate theirs, but the rich gave their trenchers to the poor. Other breads were made of the finest flour. Ale was brewed from barley, oats, and wheat. Wines were made from grapes, often flavored with herbs and flowers. The food was prepared in the great kitchen. There were many cooks and scullion boys to help them. Pigs and deer and wild boar turned on spits. Great pots of salted meat were boiled into stews, seasoned with spices only the rich lords could afford. The kitchen was a separate stone structure built on to the main house. The kitchen was connected by a long passageway to the great hall where the feast would take place. There were cupboards along the way to store the prepared food. Soon the geese, heron, and quail were roasted. So was a rare beast called a cockantries. It was really a capon and a suckling pig that were cut in half, stuffed, and sewn together again, each to the other's half, a little bit like a turducken. A peacock was cooked, then reassembled with its feathers, and four and twenty blackbirds were baked in a pie. By the time the king and his party arrived, everything was ready. The guests swarmed into the great hall at half past ten in the morning. Trumpets announced the king, who sat at the high table with his hosts and other honored guests. They washed their hands in scented water and wiped them dry on a clean towel. The bishop chanted grace. Then they ate and ate and ate. Tables and benches were set up along the sides of the hall. A fire blazed in the center, and tapestries covered the damp stone walls. The high table stood on a raised platform. Near it was a display of the Lord's finest gold vessels. The panter brought in the king's breads, trenchers, and salt cellar. The ewerer tasted the water before he poured it over the king's hands. Trumpets from the gallery sounded the start of the feast. They ate some of their food with spoons. The rest they ate with their fingers. They cut pieces from the meat. The carver put on their trenchers with knives they had brought with them. Drums beat and trumpets sounded as one surprise followed another. They ate meat pies and fish tarts and thick soups called eggerdus and buccanade. They ate boar's head and cow's tongue and pudding de swan neck. There were no forks, but napkins were provided. They shared goblets of wine and between courses, the ewerer appeared with water for them to wash their fingers. They used their little finger to sprinkle salt on their food, like this. They ate a whole castle molded out of pastry, stuffed with meat, eggs, fruits, and nuts, and wondered how they managed. Sweet and spicy sauces dripped into their trenchers as jesters, jugglers, and minstrels entertained them. Course followed course, each ending with a fancy marzipan sculpture 
called a subtlety. After the guests admired them, they ate those too. They ate and ate until dark. It was a feast fit for a king, and there would be more tomorrow. The end. The story was imagined by Aliki, but she did her homework. She researched what medieval historians have taught us, and at the end of her book, she shares this with us. The medieval feast, this one, took place toward the end of the Middle Ages, about 1400. It is fictitious, but it could have happened in real life, somewhere in England, perhaps. When the king announced he would visit, the Lord was shaken. The expense of the preparations could cost him his fortune. It had happened to others, but he had no choice. At least the Lord could be glad it was summer and there was fresh food. In winter, there would have been few vegetables and little fresh meat. Farm animals were killed in late autumn as there was not enough food to last them through the winter. The meat was preserved in salt or smoked and eaten in stews during the cold months when people could not hunt. Though stews were served at this banquet, the fresh meat, fish, and fowl were far more welcome. Medieval feasting was an art. Cooks not only prepared delicious food, they used their wild imaginations as well. They molded pastry into castles, sculptured desserts into kings and queens, and elaborate scenes, all decorated with food paints. Live jugglers jumped out of puddings. Birds were baked in pies. But sometimes live blackbirds were hidden in the pie to fly out at astonished guests. Each new dish was announced by trumpets and drums, and in between there was music and song. The Lord did his best. The king was given a feast to remember. And the next time you hear the Mother Goose rhyme, four and twenty black words were baked in a pie, you'll know that that's from the Middle Ages. Aliki uses some very fancy words in this book. A panter comes from the old Latin word for bread, which in French is pain, which in Italian is pane, and that's where the P-A-N comes from. And a panter is simply a servant who brought the bread. A ewer is someone who brought the water and linen to clean your hands as well. Marzipan is an almond paste that's sweet and used in desserts, and it was used in the Middle Ages to create little sculpture. An aigre-douce comes from two French words, aigre, meaning bitter or sour, and douce, meaning sweet. It was a sweet and sour um, way of making fish. And finally, a boucanade was a way of making roast beef. Like today, we use bu uh, beef burgundy as a way of making beef. This was beef boucanade. Packed with historical detail and packed just as well with storytelling imagination, this has been a medieval feast written and illustrated by Aliki.